So this is a fascinating panel. This is the largest panel we've had at Skift. Um, <laughs> and I wanted it for a very specific reason. We did not talk about PR last year. And obviously, we interact a lot as media with the PR. I have, in my 20 years of career in media, interacted with a lot of PR. I started, little known fact, I started as a PR uh, handing out press releases. Initially, this was. 20 years ago. Uh, but I love the other side, which is media a lot more, so that's why I switched. Um, now, obviously, the opposite happens, which is people go from media to PR. So the role of the PR professional, the communications professional, whatever people, PR people call themselves these days, because now the terms change quite a bit, um, has changed a lot in the last 10 years. Um, as you look out at the landscape, and it's gotten more manic, obviously, 24-7, how has the role of PR changed as it stands in 2015? And Nancy, you've been in the industry for 25 years. At least. Um, well, hello, everybody, and thank you for inviting me here today. Certain fundamentals of PR will never change. It's still about news. It's still about the narrative. It's about a compel compelling storytelling and about personal relationships. What's changed primarily are uh, the pace in which we work and the fractured way in which we work. There's no longer, the, the power has shifted and there's many, many voices and many conversations. So I have a couple of statistics here which I think we'll all find a little bit sobering. In the last few years, newspaper readership is down. I have 11%. Kevin disagrees. He thinks many times more than Much that. Much more than That's probably just on one day. <laughs> In one day. OK. Uh, TV news down 34%. Reporters down 17%. That, that also may be in the last right. week. <laughs> but PR specialists are up 22%. So our industry is actually very, very robust. And uh, one- Is that a good thing or a bad thing if there are less people to cover? Well, I heard a statistic last night that there are five PR people to every journalist. So I don't know how that... Uh, just by one thing I, I would add, you know, when I started in journalism a long, long time ago... And give you a background for people who don't oh, know. I, um, I, I, I started in journalism at small newspapers in North Carolina and then went to the Tampa Tribune. Uh, from there I went to Bloomberg News uh, at the very beginning of Bloomberg News. Uh, from there, I went to the Star Ledger in Newark, and then uh, the last, uh, before I took this job about 15 months ago, I was the business editor of the Associated Press in New York. And I've been at the AP for six years. I joined them right in the middle of the meltdown in 08. And, and I, you know, when I started in Tampa uh, on the business side, I was the airline reporter. You know, the, the Tampa Tribune was, you know, mid sized paper, small, mid sized airport, had an aviation reporter, airline reporter. Virtually every metro paper in America had an airline reporter. I don't know for sure, but Terry Maxson, who some of you may know at the Dallas yes, Morning News, recently retired. retired. I think he might have been the last full-time uh, airline writer at a Metro paper in, in, in the country. And that's a pretty scary thing uh, from a journalism standpoint. It, it... Yeah. Uh, so from, sorry, continue. So, yeah, just a couple more things. People's attention spans have fallen from 12 seconds to eight seconds. That sounds high. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. So we, we, you know, we really live in, in a very, very you know, ADD kind of world. And one of the biggest changes that I've found is with today's millennial workforce, and I know a lot of my colleagues here are going to be nodding their heads, the boomer generation typically had two to three jobs in their career lifetime. Millennials will typically have nine jobs in their Tell me about it. We, we see it every day, yes. So, you know, it's, it's hanging on to people, keeping them interested and challenged. And, you know, that's, it's, it's just become a very fractured ADD kind of world. And Kevin, you obviously were on the other side uh, from media, dealing with the PR people your whole life, and then now you're the chief communications officer of Delta. 
one why, two, um, how have you seen the role you saw from the other side and now that you're heading Corp Comfort, you know, one of the world's largest airlines. Is it the largest officially or one of the world's largest? Yeah. I, and, and you mean why from the standpoint of why I made the switch? Yes. I, you know, it's funny. I, um, I loved my job. I loved my career. Uh, uh, and, and there are times I still miss it. Um, but, you know, I, the AP was a special place. and I had no plans on leaving. And being business editor there is just cool. All that said, we, we'd had, uh, take, I'll tell you a quick story, you know, we'd, had, we'd have CEOs in all the time, and, and we had Richard Anderson, my, my boss and the CEO of Delta, come in, and with Ed Bastian, our president. Um, and, and he was just very impressive. And I was on the board of the business edit, Society of Business Editors and Writers, and, and we had him come in. You know, a few months later, I had Richard come down for a, uh, a conference in New York, or come up for a conference in New York for that. And next thing you know, I'm getting a call from a headhunter saying they've asked to speak to me, or Delta wants to speak to me. Okay, we went through a long process, and I still wasn't sure uh, that I wanted to do this. Uh, it was intriguing. I certainly, you know, I, I know all these stats. I live them. When, when I started at the AP, I had 125 uh, business writers and editors just in the U.S. and another 20, 25 overseas. By the time I left, I had 70 around the world. So I lost pretty much half my staff. And since I've left, they're probably down another 15 or 20. So it was getting harder and harder to harder to do. So I'm, I'm listening to Delta and listening to Richard. And, and I, uh, finally, he's offering me the job. And I, and I never suggest asking this question. But I said, Richard, I don't get it. Why am I here? I said, I, I've never done this. I, I don't know how to do CorpCom. I, I've never done it. And I'm getting to why. Because, because the, the, the answers he gave me were why I, I wanted to make the jump, but also why I wanted to work for Delta. Because he said, you're here because you're a great storyteller, and our storytelling needs to get better at Delta. It needs to kind of catch up to where we were, or the success of the company. Uh, number two, you've been a leader wherever where you've been. And number three, and most importantly, your values fit ours. And it was interesting to hear that, and, and, because, and, and the priority was on the values of the company. And so I'm thinking, you know, I get a chance to help build on that culture uh, because half my job is internal communications. So we're, we're building on that culture and we get to also tell this amazing story of Delta. And, and the turnaround of Delta, and I'm going to sound like a PR person for a sec, because uh, <laughs> I am one, but the, the turnaround at Delta is remarkable. Uh, it's one of the great turnarounds in all of corporate American history, right up there with Ford. I mean, 10 years ago, I, I think we, you know, I forget the exact, we were in bankruptcy. And yesterday we posted... Uh, uh, the, the greatest profit in, in the history, quarterly profit in the history of the industry. Uh, it's a pretty amazing story. So to be part of that has is, is just been great fun. But so that's obviously your side of the story. Mm -hmm. The other side of the story, it seems like PR is anger management for a lot of, lot of your life. The consumer PR, mm -hmm. social media, consumers. When Twitter first came, the first complaint, the first tweet was probably about an airline, almost <laughs> guaranteed, after Jack's first tweet. Um, something about airline or whatever messed up. <laughs> Social media, Twitter has become the venting for cable companies and airlines. Airlines yep. are probably the top. How do you then reconcile what consumers are saying to you 24-7 globally? And then you sitting at the head of Corpcom, leading a big team, a lot of people on social media, that's become the main customer service line, where do you see the disconnect? A, what is your story that we're missing? Uh, what our story about this? About like the, the turnaround of a brand versus the venting that happens. Is that, I think there's think, always going to be, when you have an operation as complicated as an airline, and, and I like to kind of lay it out uh, this way to people, sometimes you, you forget. The idea of marketing someone a ticket, getting them to buy a ticket, getting them you know, into, to an airport, getting them through security, getting them into with airplanes that are fully uh, safe and, 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 and are in good working order and crews that are, know exactly what they're doing, get them on board, get them up in the air, get, them, get their luggage on, and so on. I don't need to go through it all because you guys know that. It's an amazingly complex process. I don't think there's a more complex industry in all of, uh, all of corporate America, and I've covered virtually every industry. So, yeah, there, things are going to go wrong. And, and part of our job is dealing with it when they do. But I would say that, that, that it's, I would make the case a lot of that is overblown. You know, that, that tends to sometimes drown out some of it. But the success of Delta and, and this, you know, other airlines, but the success of Delta is pretty remarkable. When yesterday, I think Delta flew 30-some hundred, almost 4,000 flights. 
mainline flights. We canceled one, and that's considered a bad day at Delta. Uh, the completion factors we're running have never been done. The operations at Delta have never been done in this industry. Uh, the service at Delta is better. Is it going to, you know, but when you're, when you're dealing with 300,000 and 400,000 people a day, things are going to run. How do you cut through the noise? Because obviously there's a lot of noise. Well, one of the things we have, you know, we've tried, you know, when I got to Delta, uh, there were a lot of things I don't, didn't know how to do. Uh, and, I, and I rely, I've got an amazing staff who, who have long-time veteran communications people, and they're kind of teaching me a lot of things. I, we, we cut through it by telling our story. One of the first things we started after a few months got developed was the Delta News Hub, which if you're not familiar with it, I, I would encourage you to do it. And the numbers are, are, are growing uh, every day, and that it, it's, it's essentially a news site for Delta. When, when I, and pardon me for jumping around, but... One of the first things I noticed when I, when I was interviewing for the job, and I at the, the Delta news page was a list of press releases and the, the ubiquitous photo of the airplane. I didn't know a single journalist who ever went on that website. Uh, and that's, that's a missed opportunity. So we create the news hub, and the news hub is meant to take, bring journalism values and quality and, 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 and uh, interest. So you know, you're going to find all sorts of different stories about Delta told journalistically, with videos, with graphics, with... Uh, you know, stories that have really good leads and nut grabs and, 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 and great headlines. We want journalists, first and foremost, to come there. We want them to steal everything. You know, there's nothing, nothing they can't have. And, and you know, they can have headlines, they can take stories, they can take the videos and photos. And we're actually seeing some of that, particularly in, in a lot of markets where, in, in particularly broadcast uh, websites and all, where they are taking the content and just putting it on as if it was written by them, uh, themselves or other, other journalists. And we, so we're telling these stories, and, and yes, it's told through the prism of Delta and, and our eyes. No, it's not unbiased journalism, but it, it's, it's a little more different. It's not straight PR either. It's not straight news releases. I, I, I don't yeah. remember any, the last time, when I, can, I, I was for 25 years, I can't remember the last time I saw a new, read a news release. Um, Another change. He drank the Kool-Aid, wouldn't you say? <laughs> no, no, oh my God, you're a convert. So... Um, in terms of um, in terms of, of uh, journalists, does the consumer media, with all the changes they've gone through, still matter to your brands, the, the brands that you that you represent? And you cannot you know, say the answer is the, not yes. You know, at the end of the day, um, I don't have a client who would not want to be in the New York Times. Right. I mean, they all want. Well, that. New York Times. There's always a a, a, uh, a case. Sure, forget New York Times. But that's just one small portion because you have to talk to all your audiences and I would say that most of the millennials are the young people who I interview today I ask them what they read I always ask what do you read because they're it not tells me reading on an ass traveler no, travel and leisure no they they read Twitter in the morning to get their news so we have to we have to talk to them in in the language what and in the snippets that they're going after you know, I used to give a media test for anyone who came to work for me, and it's so obsolete now to find out. What was the media test? The media test was, uh, what day does the food section in the New York Times oh run? Yeah. Uh, it's obsolete. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. what, what is page six? Uh, what's the, you know, which, which of these publications are trades, which are consumer? And it would let me know how well they knew the media, yeah. because that was a criteria. Writing skills was were that was another criteria, which I think today what's the test it's, now? It's, it's it's a bonus. We give people more strategic thinking tests. Here's a here's a scenario. Tell us how you would where you would put this story or or how you would handle this. And sometimes we just look for out of the box creative ideas. We're looking for integrations. You know, there's a lot of. I mean, when I see that that people are branding luggage now with different brands, I'm thinking, that's a great idea. It's something that was unbranded. You know, how, do we can, how can we use that for our clients? So we look for different things now. It's funny, the, the, the phrase storytelling is, is a, become a cliche, but it is, it is ultimately what you, we have to do. It, it is, and and the, the, the modes of storytelling change, whether it's the New York Times, whether it's Twitter, but, but good fundamental content uh, is, is critical. I, we, we were having a discussion recently, and this made one of my staff members cringe, but, you know, and, and you know, with, with people who had helped design the news hub, 
and we're going through, well, you know, what do you want? And the certain content has to hit certain demographics and 15% here and 10% here. And, and like, just stop it. I said, you know, this, we ha the focus needs to be on producing good content first. And it has to be stuff that's readable or, or viewable and it has a clear message and a clear, uh, something that, a clear takeaway. And, but then how are you thinking of distributing that on your end, the create? Uh, th th in that case, th th right, we have to look at all the channels. I mean, you know, one thing I like about the News Hub is we can control that. I mean, we can, we, there's a social media component of that, and we can kind of, we have some control over it. But yeah, we're, we're still, you know, we're still, you know, we still care about the Wall Street Journal, we still care about the wires, but we also care about Quartz, and we care about uh, BuzzFeed, and we care about... One more, you have to add that. And we care about Skiff more than anybody else. Thank you, appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so... Let's change tactics a tiny bit. The culture of junketism and travel, junkets, historically has driven media, travel media, a long time. You know this from your mm -hmm. previous experience. It's now the new, th you know, in used to be, now, you know, after the internet came, bloggers became, tried to travel bloggers, nobody reads them. Um, then Instagrammers and influencers are there now. Do they matter? It does matter, and it matters more and more. First of all, I'd never use the word junket. It seems sort of pejorative. But that's what it is. But, you know, press trips are really the opportunity to bring people to experience something so that, and we want honest, authentic writing. Nobody wants PR stuff. So, you know, we know who good writers are, and we know who's going to tell a good story and, um, and an honest story that people want to read. That's good for us. Yes. Um, but we no longer, airlines aren't really cooperating. The flights are full. So people have to have budgets in order to fly or you know, get people from point A to point B. And, but um, hotels and destinations are, still care. They still care very much because people especially. can't cover a destination without going there and experiencing it. So um, that is still a very integral part of, of what we do. But we're doing more and more influencer and Instagrammer trips. It just takes more time to qualify them because and we don't know How are you thinking about qualifying well. them? Not, not qualifying the results on the other end. Of like Instagram uh, or Instagram something. Okay, a million people saw it. What does that mean? Well, it's probably a little too early to tell, although I'd ask Kristen, our social media strategist out there, we just did an Instagrammer trip and an influencer trip down to Aruba. And I, you know, I think the client was really thrilled with it. It was a new audience for them. We have a client we've done a lot of social media with, and they said, well, thanks. It's a luxury property. And they said, thanks a lot. We're getting all these tattooed guests now. I mean, that's, that's sort of how we knew it was working. They see all these people <laughs> paying high rates, but with tattoos on at their, at their bar. <laughs> so. I can't top that. Kind of. <laughs> As Kevin, your job now, how much of your time is spent thinking about consumers, building the direct relationships to consumers? instead of media, well, obviously you, a lot of your time, as you mentioned, is spent internal. How much of the time is spent directly trying to build a bridge to the consumer? There's some of that. I mean, you know, it, it Delta marketing and, and uh, communications are, are very separate. Uh, uh, and Do you so, think that's a mistake? No, I don't. Uh, I, I, because we work closely with marketing. Uh, and, 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 you know, talk to me in five years when I've done this job longer. Uh, I, I don't have a lot of history to, to, you know, really authoritatively say. But from where I sit, you know, we have so many things going on. Because as, as you said earlier, we, we're, we're, it's 24-7, it's, it's often crisis motivated. And, and it's, it's hard to do everything. Uh, now, we work very closely with our marketing department. Um, and, and, and we help guide them. And, 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 and listen, the part of the news hub is marketing. Part of the news hub, while it's the focus is on journalists, it's also, you know, when we get 10,000 hits a day, uh, and it's, it's about two months old now, if we get 10,000 hits a day, there aren't 10,000 journalists out there. So we're, 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 we're reaching a consumer market for that, and that's important. That will continue to grow. Um, but uh, but you know, part of the thing, and, and not to go off topic, but a lot of our, how we structure my day or our day and our, our you know, is internal communications. We have 80,000 employees, and one of the key reasons the Delta turnaround is the culture. And, 
and, and making sure that that is, um, we maintain that culture. So internal communication, I look at it that we have 80,000 employees and 30,000 people or retirees have access to our internal site every day. That's the size of a Metro newspaper. And we need to work, provide them with really good information as well. So yeah, um, so yeah I'm, I'm sorry if we could jump up. No, that's okay, great. Authoritatively, um, can't say. Is Richard Anderson on Twitter? No. Are you trying to get him on? No. Why? Because you have to be authentic on Twitter. You have to be authentic in social media. And he's not? No, he's the most authentic person you've ever seen because of who he is. And, you know, he's Barron's just named him one of the 50 best CEOs in the world. Uh, and you can't argue with the results. And he's an amazing human being. I mean, he talks, he cares about values, it's, you know, he, and, and he preaches it. Uh, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't be good on Twitter. Okay. And, and, and it's not necessary for us to be. You know, the, the product speaks for itself. We have, other, we have, we have a very vibrant social media, uh, very teams and, and, and ways we reach people with social media. Richard doesn't have to be. And, and Nancy, would you think from your perspective as you look at clients, would do you recommend CEOs being on Twitter 100% or, you know, any social media channel directly? LinkedIn, for instance. I think, does he write for LinkedIn? I don't know if yeah. he does. Okay. No. I think it really depends on the person. You know, I think if you can't do it well, don't do it. That's, or and again, if, if it's going to come across as forced or it's going to come across, it doesn't need to be. I mean, a CEO CEO is busy enough. Right. You know, when you're running, a, you're running a, a, you know, a company as large as Delta, uh, if, if, my, if my CEO is on Twitter, I got a problem because he needs to be doing other things. Yeah. Uh, we have time for a few questions, if anybody has them. Joe here this has. Oh, somebody there has. There's a few back there, too. Hi, Kevin. I'm Joe Leader. I'm the CEO of the Airline Passenger Experience Association. Your marketing team was kind enough to lend an aircraft to us for a video shoot. So thank you very much for Delta and your assistance. The question that I have for you is really on passenger engagement and your employees. Delta, one of the things I've seen in advertisements around Atlanta, you know, our difference are our people. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you from your experience, what makes Delta, in your opinion, among the American Airlines, the one that stands out in terms of passenger experience? Uh, there's a lot of ways to, uh, you could answer that, uh, but you know, th there's a feeling at Delta, and this it sounds cliche-ish in a way, but that if you take care of your people, they're going to take care of your customers. And it starts there. It doesn't start with, we've got to take care of our customers first. I mean, that's ultimately the end game. But when you have happy employees, when we just gave our employees a 14.5% pay increase. Now, which, which, you know, some of that comes from a change to the profit sharing program, but it's still the most generous profit sharing program in certainly the airline industry and we think all of corporate America. Um, so they get a stake in the profits. They get, the, the, by, they're the best paid employee groups uh, in all of the airline industry. Uh, there's a feeling that they, they can walk into to Richard's office or anywhere and, and, and have conversations and have dialogues with their leadership and they have a say in things. That's where it starts. Question there? Go ahead. Can you all hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm Valeria. I'm a public relations account supervisor with BCF in Virginia Beach. I am a millennial and my favorite magazine is Afar, so we are still picking up some print copies. <laughs> um, my question is <laughs> primarily for um, Nancy. Um, is the press release dead and, and how do you advise your clients who have limited PR budgets but demands that you still produce press releases on a pretty regular basis? Isn't that occasion? every client at this stage? But <laughs> you know, I think it's really your job to advise and provide the counsel to your clients. I think a press release has a place in the world, especially if you're announcing something, but it's really not your main communication tool. And I think it should be really limited because the attention span for the journalist, and you have to put yourself in their shoes. And I feel bad for them every day. They get hundreds of shit thrown at them every single day. You know, how does, it, how does your message stand through? And a press release really, isn't necessarily the best way. The personal relationship, a, 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 a crafted pitch particular to that person is just much more effective. But you know, if you're announcing something globally and you want to send a press release to a large group of people, I think that makes sense. But after that, it's really, it just has very limited use. Well, on, on related to that, because uh, I agree with everything Nancy says, uh, you know, but what, I, mean, I want to pick up something you said earlier on relationships. 
you know, you know, one of the things I really impress upon my people is, is building those relationships with reporters. Now, you're not going to be able to have a relationship with everybody, but the key 10, 20, 30 people uh, you need to, you know, that when you do have something, you don't care about a president. You're going to them to talk to them about it, and they're going to listen because you've spent time with them. Uh, and, and that's, I, I can't overstate. It's the same thing when I was an editor guiding reporters. You know, you've got to have sources. You've got to take the time to build those human relationships, and they will pay off. Question there. Um, yes, uh, good afternoon. Mohammed from My Hotels uh, Today, a new startup. The press has evolved, and now the way how we write press releases or how we, we try to get the, the message out to the press have changed. What is the new challenge for PR agencies in the future to communicate and get the message out? Is it the content? Is it the, the way how they present the content, the messaging? Bad news sell better than the good news? Like, what, is, what do you see the future of PR for travel? Thank you. Well, as I said initially, it's always about news. And everyone has different ideas of what news is. But you know, if you're able to craft a strong enough narrative and it's of interest to people, I think you're going to be successful. And uh, you know, it really depends um, on what, what the message is. It's just really about news value or creating something that's fun and irresistible. As I tell my staff that all the time, make it irresistible. We'll take one last question. I'm going to take executive privilege. One last question. Go ahead. The woman there. Sorry, oh. both are women. Sure, one of them. Sorry. Hi, my name's Alessia, Hudson County Tourism in New Jersey. Um, maybe it's more of a marketing question, but it can be PR. Like bloggers like Nomadic Mats and the Points Guy, people like that, do you see that being a growing trend where you know these people are getting endorsed by airline companies, credit card companies, that you know, maybe the PR team or marketing teams are bringing them on to help spread messages or, you know, help remedy maybe bad experiences that guests might have with airlines? You know, it's funny. I, 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 I was afraid there was going to be a question I couldn't answer. Um, uh, and I, you know, I don't, because I'm not sure, to be honest, how much of that we're doing. We, we don't do that in Corpcom. Our marketing department might uh, in terms of dealing with it. I mean, we do deal with those bloggers on a, uh, you know, in terms of a, a story and communication standpoint, but I, I'm not they sure. They want free flights. That that's all they want. That's my view of the world. I'm sorry. They want free flights. A lot of them. Who doesn't? <laughs> anyway, with that, we are out of time. Thank you very much for a very engaging discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.